Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this week's episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lessons, you'll be studying the doctrine that's found in sections 14, 15, 16, and 17. And I'm going to take a few minutes now and share with you all the fun, uplifting, inspiring stories from church history that were going on during the same time period in which Joseph received these four revelations. As always, I feel that if we have a good historical background on what's going on, the stories become more relatable to our lives. We liken them to ourselves, as Nephi asked us to do, and the doctrine can take on such a greater meaning into our own personal lives. So what I'm going to do is share with you all the stories about Joseph, Emma, and Oliver relocating to Fayette, New York to reside with the Whitmers. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Whitmer family, and I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the time talking about the three witnesses, the experience they had in seeing the plates, the angel, and then what happened to them after that the rest of their lives. I'm going to share with you that brief, brief, those brief stories, but I'm also going to share with you three additional stories of three people who also had a witness of the Book of Mormon. Those three other witnesses happen to be female. So I'm excited to share all these great stories with you as you're looking at the doctrine found in these four wonderful sections. So to pick up where we left off, so we keep things chronologically. Joseph and Emma are residing in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Oliver Cowdery is working as a scribe, and he and Joseph are working full-time at a very rapid pace in translating the Book of Mormon. They're nearing completion. They've now had the Aaronic Priesthood restored. They've been baptized, and the persecution is really heating up in Harmony. Joseph knows that if they are to complete the work of translation, they need to get out of town. Now, they couldn't go back to Joseph's home in Palmyra because there was persecution there. So Joseph asked Oliver to inquire of his friend, David Whitmer, if the three of them, Joseph, Emma, and Oliver, could move in with the Whitmer family in Fayette, New York. Now Fayette is about 100 miles north of the present-day Priesthood Restoration site. And Fayette's about 40 miles south of Joseph's hometown of Palmyra. Jo uh, David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery were more than acquaintances. They had a, a friendship. They had a bond, but they had a common interest, and that was the work of translation. Now, David and Oliver became acquainted with each other in Palmyra while uh, Oliver was living there and while David would frequent Palmyra on business trips. They started to inquire with each other about these rumors that they were hearing about Joseph Smith and, and this gold Bible that he had. Well, you know the rest of the story because I've already told it in previous episodes that Oliver he gains a testimony by way of the Spirit, which inspires him to go to Harmony and offer his services as scribe to Joseph, which he does. David and Oliver stay in touch, and Oliver will write a few letters to David during this time saying, I'm involved in this work. I have a testimony of it. It's really happening. It's really real. And so David starts to gain a testimony that the work is true before he meets Joseph, of course, before he reads anything out of the Book of Mormon, because he believes Oliver's testimony. David shares that testimony with his family, with his parents, his siblings, and the entire Whitmer family has a belief, has faith, that something of God is happening in Harmony, Pennsylvania. So Oliver writes a letter to David saying, the work of translation is continuing on. We're not done yet. We need to wrap it up. But persecution is such in harmony that we need to get out of town. Can we move in with your family at the Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York, and finish this work? David takes the letter to his parents. And although they have a testimony, as, as, as big or as little as it is, they, they, at, least have a, a, they at least want to have a, a testimony that the work is true. They trust Oliver they feel that, that something good and right is happening. And so they don't dismiss it entirely. But it's planting season. They've got to get their fields ready. And the Whitmer farm is huge. Although mother and father Whitmer have a lot of children, a lot of helping hands, there's a lot of work to be done. David says, I feel that this is the work of God. They're seeking our assistance. I think that Joseph and Emma and Oliver should be invited to move in here into our home. And Father Whitmer says, uh, that's fine, we can do it, but not yet. We've got a lot of work to do on the farm. Let's get ahead of the work a little bit and then we can bring them in. Right now we don't have time to host visitors. David gets to work. He makes somewhat of a deal with his dad. If I get my work done, can I go to Harmony and bring him here? Yes, you can do that. David goes out and starts plowing his field. 
and it's hard work and it's rocky and the soil needs to be turned over a lot by the plow and he's just throwing everything he can into the work and after a couple of days he looks at his field and he realizes how much more he needs to do so he offers a prayer out there on the in the field and the prayer is not recorded but it's essentially david asking heavenly father if if this is your work and this is what you want me to do help me help me out i've got too much going on in my life and i i want to focus on on helping but i just need your help the prayer was answered david went in at the end of that day after that prayer went in for the night the next morning he comes out and two-thirds of his approximately which is about three acres of the land is perfectly plowed. It's not only perfectly plowed, but it's done, David would testify, in the way that David would have done it himself. His father comes out and he sees the miracle that happened overnight. He sees that two thirds of the field is done and it's ready for planting. And Father Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Sr., says to David that this must be of God. Go to harmony right now. Don't waste any more time. Go to harmony and get Joseph, Emma, and Oliver and tell them that they are welcome here. Now, a couple of interesting things here. The field wasn't completely done. It was most of the way done. The Lord, through this miracle, gave way for David to have his desires realized in that he needed to get the work done, but he desperately wanted to be a part of the work and assist in, in, in the work that Joseph and Oliver were involved in. So the Lord gave him a big push, gave him a big head start, but he just didn't do everything. There was still some work to be done by David. He couldn't just roll out of bed and have the Lord hand him every blessing on a silver platter. He gave David a good push and a good head start, but it was still up to David to cross the finish line. What a lesson there. Lucy Smith, the mother of Joseph, would record in her journal. She wasn't there at the time, so it was just, it was the story that was passed along. But the way that she recorded it is that one of the young Whitmer daughters looked out the window and saw three men working on the field. And those three men worked all through the night and into the early hours of the next morning. And when they left, they refused pay. They refused payment for their labor. Uh, the story's lacking in detail, of course, as to who offered the payment and who spoke and those sorts of things. But the way I just told it to you is the way that, it, that it's recorded. Three men worked all through the night, witnessed by the, a young Whitmer daughter. And uh, when they were done with the work that they they had accomplished through the night and early morning, they refused pay. Well, with this, David get, hooks up a horse to a wagon and he heads the 100 miles south to Harmony, Pennsylvania. He packs up Oliver and Joseph and the three of them return to Fayette. Emma Smith would follow two to three weeks later. They move into Fayette. They're given a room there in the home. And by the way, <laughs> forgive me, Pictured behind me is the reconstructed home of Peter and Mary Whitmer on the Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York today. This is the way it looks today. And uh, if you were to visit the site, uh, you'd be able to go inside the home and see what life in the 1820s and 1830s was like. Timepiece, uh, furniture, and, and um, it'd just give you an idea of what life was like there on the farm. So pictured behind me, this is the Peter and Mary Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York that you see. This is where all these great experiences happen. Now, the cabin, of course, is not original, but the ground is where the miracle of the, of the plowing happened, the miracle of the three witnesses, and all the other miracles I'm about to tell you. It happened right here on this ground here in New York. So back to the story. He, he's packing up uh, Oliver and Joseph. Emma would follow about three weeks later. They get to the Fayette farm or the Whitmer farm in Fayette, and they're given a room to be their, their workspace and Joseph and, and Oliver get right back to work and they're immediately going through and they're, and they're going through the translation miraculously quickly. Well, through all of these experiences, the letters from Oliver, the miraculous plowing of the field, and now having Joseph and Oliver in the home, 
And Mary would testify of the feeling that they would have. She would talk about the countenance on their face when they would come down for lunch or other meals or to take a break, how they just seemed to glow. And they were full of the Spirit. Through these and other experiences, the Whitmer family, all of them, mom and dad and all the kids, they quickly gained a testimony of the truthfulness of this work. However, despite having the prophet live with them and this great, marvelous, wondrous work taking place there in their home, there was still a lot of work to do. And uh, so all the kids and mom and dad would be working and they would uh, be, be busy working on the farm. And one day, Mary Whitmer, the mother, she comes uh, out of the home after spending the entire day taking care of her large family, the home, and these three guests. She's now taking care of Joseph and Emma and Oliver, and she's still got lots of work to do. The sun's going down, and yet her work is, her to-do list still isn't done. She's heading out across the field towards the barn, and she sees out in the distance Joseph and Oliver taking a break from the work of translation. They're skipping rocks on a little pond. There's a few ducks swimming out there, and she says out loud, if you have time to throw stones at ducks, surely you have time to help me with some of these chores. And with that kind of attitude, she goes into the barn to milk the cow. She says that she was startled when she walked into the barn. There was an old man there. She didn't recognize him. She didn't know who he was. And she said that her fear quickly went away when he called her by name when he greeted her as Mary. And then she, he started to speak to her. Now, this account was told by Mary to her, to lots of people, but the recorded version that I'm, I'm gonna share with you here, a couple of quotes, count, comes from John C. Whitmer, who is Mary's grandson. And I think it's important to see that John Whitmer wrote this in 1878, 49 years after the experience that Mary had that I'm about to share with you, and about 40 years after the Whitmers became disassociated with the church. Despite time and, and relationships, the story continues as this. John C. Whitmer writes, I have heard my grandmother, Mary Whitmer, say on several occasions that she was shown the plates of the Book of Mormon by a holy angel. She walks in, an old man calls her by name. He takes a, a, this knapsack, she calls it, a, a backpack off of her, his shoulder, opens it up and pulls the plates out. He holds them in front of her and turns the pages over leaf by leaf. And she's able to witness not only what the plates look like, but she's able to examine the characters that are engraven on the plates. And the story continues from the, the grandson. From that moment, my grandmother was enabled to perform her household duties with comparative ease, and she felt no more inclination to murmur because her lot was hard. I knew my grand grandmother to be a good, noble, and truthful woman, and I have not the least doubt of her statement in regard to seeing the plates being str strictly true. She was a strong believer in the Book of Mormon until the day of her death, even though she became less active. Actually, she became inactive. She stayed in Missouri when the saints went to Nauvoo. She stayed in Missouri when the state saints went to Salt Lake, and that's where she died. But to the day she died, according to her grandson, 49 years after this experience, she never doubted her testimony, and she always stayed true to it. Now, I told you that I'd tell you the story of the three witnesses and the three witnesses of, that were female, I had to kind of mix them up a little bit to stay chronological. So she has this experience. It, David Whitmer would say that she was able to have this increased energy and strength. She never murmured or complained again, and uh, she just went forward now having this sure witness of the Book of Mormon, having seen the plates herself. Now let's get to section seven. Actually, we'll get to section 17 in a second. I want to make just one brief point. It's not historical, but I hope you'll allow me to do it anyway. In section 15 and six, section 14 is given to David Whitmer. Now you know who the Whitmers are. You understand their, where they're at uh, spiritually and with their testimony and everything else. David Whitmer gets uh, 
of Revelation, that's section 14, and then his brothers receive section 15 and 16. It's interesting that 15 and 16 are identical word for word. And why is the Lord giving revelations that are identical word for word? Probably because he really wants to make sure we understand what's going on in it. Now, so 15 and 16, you'll have a great time studying out that doctrine on your own. But I do want to make mention of one single word, and that's found in verse 6 of each of those sections, 15 and 16. And that's the word rest. There is a little bit of historical context here. And so I indulge myself in, in sharing it with you. Sometimes I like to go back to the 1828 edition of Webster's Dictionary. And why is that? Because sometimes in the English language, words that mean something at one time evolve and start to mean something at a later time. And so I like to go and look at the words that were relevant or the definition of those words that were being used in the time period of church history so that we can really understand what the Lord was, was saying, perhaps. And the word that I'd like to share with you in verse 6 is the word rest. The Lord gives them specific commandments, and then he concludes these two revelations, that you may bring souls unto me, that you may rest with them in the kingdom of my Father. Now, according to the super old dictionary, the word rest, one of the definitions is a state of reconciliation with God. Now, how do you become reconciled with God? It's through repentance, which is permissible by way of the atonement. And so as we look a little bit further, or deeper, not even deeper, just on the surface of verse 6, he, uh, uh, well, the whole section, he's talking about declaring repentance so that you can find rest. Repent, made possible through the atonement, so that we can become reconciled to our Heavenly Father and dwell with them in the kingdom. All right, so there's just a little side note there. Now, section 17. As they're translating the Book of Mormon, it becomes clear, of course, to Oliver that there are to be three witnesses called three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. We learn it from Isaiah, who Nephi quotes Isaiah, so it's, it's there in the Book of Mormon. We learn it from Moroni, and we learn it from the Lord in previous revelations as well as section 17. Oliver inquires of Joseph, can I be one of the witnesses? Oliver was told no because it was not time. Uh, Martin requ requests, can I be one of the witnesses? Can I see the plate? Excuse me, he doesn't request, can I be a witness? He says, can I see the plates? This is section 10. And the Lord says, no, not now, but if you humble yourself and have faith, then there will be an opportunity for you to see the plates. So there's our two. And then David is the third one. So Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. Did I say two names? This David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris are three witnesses. They approach Joseph and ask if they can be the, fulfill the, the prophecy and be the witnesses for the Book of Mormon. Of course, Joseph prays about it. It's revealed to him that, yes, indeed, those three individuals will be these long foretold witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Well, they go out to the Whitmer farm. They stay on the property. David Whitmer describes exactly where it is by the distance and direction from the home. And so we're very confident that it was on the farm, not far from the picture that you see behind me. The four of them go out and they begin to pray. And according to the, the recorded history of the church by Joseph Smith, he says that the four of them began to pray that, and the, the answer they were seeking to their prayers that the prophecy might be fulfilled and the plates would be shown to these three individuals. They each take a turn praying. Nothing happens. They each take another turn praying. Still, nothing happens. At this, Martin Harris stands up and he says, it's because of me. The Lord has not forgiven me for my transgression. Now, what's the transgression that he's referring to? Losing the 116 pages. So he, he leaves, and Joseph doesn't follow him. Neither does David or Oliver. He leaves, and it's just the three of them now. And they begin to pray again. And immediately after the third one, whoever it was, concluded their prayer. So they each took a turn praying. At that point, the angel appears and shows them the plates. I'll read to you a quote of what they heard. As they are seeing the angel, and the angel is showing them the plates, 
turning the leaves over so they can examine the characters on it. While this experience is happening, they hear a voice out of heaven. And the voice says, these plates have been revealed by the power of God. And they have been translated by the power of God. The translation of them, which you have seen, is correct. And I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. They were commanded to bear record of these things. Well, they would do so most obviously by writing out a statement, each signing their name to it. And that statement, the testimony of the three witnesses, is now published in every copy of the Book of Mormon in every language that spread throughout the entire world. Their testimony has gone to the four corners of the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. They would also spend the rest of their lives testifying outside of that statement that what they had seen and heard was true. I'll tell you a couple of those stories in just a moment, but let's not forget about Martin Harris, who had wandered off. After the experience happened, uh, where the angel appeared with the plates. Joseph went looking for Martin, and he found him a little ways off, and he was praying. He was praying for forgiveness still for the 116 pages that he had lost. Joseph approaches Martin, and they have a little conversation about how the Lord will never forgive me, he tells Joseph. And it seems evident that the Lord was ready to forgive, but Martin was having a hard time forgiving Martin. They prayed together, and as they were praying together, the vision opened up, and there was the angel with the plates. And David, or excuse me, and Martin, although apart from David and Oliver, had the exact same experience that the two of them had had in examining the plates. In fact, so overcome was Martin with this experience, he called it off. He says, he says, tis enough, tis enough, mine eyes have beheld. And he knew it was true. Nothing doubting. Now, I'll remind you of something that I shared with you when we talked about the first vision several weeks ago. And that's the word vision. Again, going back to the, the word nerd that I might be, in the 1828 version of the Webster's Dictionary, the word vision simply means actual sight, which might be kind of the opposite of what it means today. And so when these men talk about their vision that they had, remember, it's actual sight that they had. That was their intended meaning. Let's start with Oliver Cowdery. What happens next? Oliver Cowdery stays faithful with Joseph. He finishes off the translation. He moves to Palmyra and oversees the publication of the Book of Mormon with the help of Hiram Smith. They work as a companionship to make sure that everything goes smoothly throughout the entire translation. Well, while he's doing that, then Joseph is still at Fayette. He's holding church general conferences there at the Whitmer Farm. And eventually, and I'll tell you the full length story in, in coming weeks, eventually he moves to Kirtland. After the publication of the Book of Mormon, uh, Oliver would join uh, Joseph and the rest of the church members in Kirtland. And, uh, and then from Kirtland, Joseph would send Oliver and also David to Missouri to oversee the affairs of the church there. Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer were, were in Missouri uh, seeing, presiding over the church there. Um, but there's also the time when Oliver Cowdery was in the Kirtland Temple with Joseph. And together, the two of them beheld visions, actual sight, of the Savior, as recorded in section 110, and also as recorded in section 110, the three ancient prophets who bestowed upon them the keys of the priesthood. We'll talk about that when we get to section 109 and section 110 and section 45 and others. But for the time being, that's who Oliver was. Now, while he was in Missouri, he and Joseph didn't quite see eye to eye on a couple of things. Uh, there was no general church handbook. Uh, there was only one prophet, no precedence uh, to follow. And so they were still, they were young. They were still trying to figure these things out. And Oliver's difference of opinion kind of got him into a little bit of trouble with pride and a little bit of anger, hostility perhaps. And for that, he disassociated himself from the church. He was excommunicated. And with that excommunication, he went north and practiced law for the next several years. He never went to Nauvoo. David Whitmer, very same story. He uh, had, had similar issues and problems not with his testimony, but just with the functionality 
of, of the way that the church was organizing and, and working. Um, outside, separated from doctrine. Uh, outside and separated from testimony. Outside and separated from Joseph's prophetic calling. But he let those things fester inside of him and, and it, it concluded in his excommunication. He didn't go north, he stayed there in Missouri. When the saints got driven out and pushed eastward and ended up in Nauvoo, the Whitmer family stayed in Richmond, Missouri. And there in Richmond, Missouri, David lived the rest of his life and he lived a long life. He didn't die until the late 1880s. He became a very prominent citizen in Richmond and he even became mayor uh, there. And he died with the testimony of the Book of Mormon on his lips literally on his deathbed and I'll share that with you word for word testimony in just a moment. They say that David Whitmer perhaps is, if there is one, the most important of the three witnesses. The reason being is he carried a lot of clout and with that he, he utilized that to spread his testimony of the Book of Mormon with others. Excommunicated in 1838 or so, 36 perhaps, and was it 1836, I believe, and then didn't die until the late 1880s. 50 years, he would seek out opportunities to testify of the Book of Mormon. Reporters would come to him and record his testimony and put it in newspapers and publish it throughout the entire United States. Missionaries from Salt Lake going east would stop in and pay David Whitmer a visit and ask him, can you share with us your testimony of the Book of Mormon? They would record it and share it with the saints. His testimony would go on and on and on to thousands and tens of thousands. And now that it's published in the Book of Mormon, or because it's published in the Book of Mormon, his testimony has gone into the ears and hearts of millions and millions of people throughout the world. He never denied his testimony, although he was not a member of the church for the last 50 years of his life. Near the time of his death, 1887, he says, and it was in response to a, a critical newspaper article that doubted the testimony and said, well, maybe David, you've been mistaken. He says this, in quite boldness, I will say once more to all mankind that I have never at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof. I also testify to the world that neither Oliver Cowdery nor Martin Harris ever at any time denied their testimony. They both died. He outlived the other two. They both died reaffirming the truth of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. I was present at the deathbed of Oliver Cowdery. And I'll tell you that story in a second. I was present at the deathbed of Oliver Cowdery and his last words were, his last words were, Brother David, be true to your testimony of the Book of Mormon. Now Oliver Cowdery, he's disassociated himself with the church. He misses the entire Nauvoo and Carthage experience. The saints are starting to move west. And with that news, it must have stirred something in him. He wanted to get back active in the church. By this time, the saints had moved, most of them, or the presiding members of the church had moved to winter quarters. And he went to winter quarters and he sought to be rebaptized. He wanted to be back in the church. And he went before the high council. He expressed deep regret and sorrow he sought forgiveness and tried to prove to him that he had been through the repentance process and he greatly desired to be reassociated with the church. Now, some members of the high council were pretty hesitant. They thought that Oliver was coming to reclaim his station. Now that Joseph's dead, is he coming back to claim the presidency? And they had these conversations and Oliver Calvary boldly told them, I seek no station other than to simply be reassociated with the saints. They believed him and granted him to be baptized. He was baptized. Now he, and he was making preparations to go west to Salt Lake. His, his wife was the sister of David Whitmer. Before going west, she wanted to go to Richmond, Missouri and say goodbye to her brother. 
Of course, Oliver was okay with that. Why, why, why would he deny such a request? And he had wanted to see his friend, David. So the two of them headed down, or their family, they headed down to Richmond, Missouri. If you were going to drive it, it would take you about three hours from Richmond to Winter Quarters. And they, they headed down from Winter Quarters down to Richmond, Missouri, and they met with David. And a short time after arriving there in Richmond, Oliver got sick. And he passed away there in Richmond before being able to go to Salt Lake. But he died full fellowship, his membership, in the church. And that's why David Whitmore was there when Oliver was on his deathbed. In addition to what he said, he also that final testimony that he gave to David that I just read to you, I'll read to you a quote that Oliver testified in 1848. Now, if you look at the timeline, in 1848, this is the time, this is about the time that he's seeking rebaptism. And he, he testifies this way. I, I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon <clears throat> as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith as he translated it by the gift and power of God. I beheld with my hands the gold plates from which they are transcribed. I also saw with my eyes and handled with my hands the holy interpreters. It containing, referring back to the Book of Mormon now, it contains the everlasting gospel, and it contains the principles of salvation. And if you, my hearers, will walk by its light and obey its precepts, you will be saved with an everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God on high. Now, he gives a little bit extra that the other witnesses don't, at least in the recorded uh, entries that I, or um, testimonies that I'm going to share with you. He testifies that he saw everything, but then he takes it to another level of testimony. Joseph would say that a person will get nearer to God by abiding by the precepts of the Book of Mormon than by, than by any other book. And Oliver, in his testimony of the Book of Mormon, testifies of that. He pleads with us, Latter-day Saints, if you, my hearers, will walk by its light, the light of the Book of Mormon, and obey its precepts, you will be saved with an everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God on high. Level one testimony, I saw the plates. Level two, what's contained in those plates, what's contained in the Book of Mormon, will lead you back. If you obey, will lead you back to live with our Heavenly Father in the, in the celestial kingdom. So Oliver Cowdery passes away. That leaves us with Martin Harris. Martin Harris followed the saints to Kirtland, and then he stayed there. He didn't follow the saints to Missouri. He didn't follow them to um, Nauvoo. He wasn't around with Joseph when he died in Carthage. And then Brigham led the saints to Salt Lake. And still, Martin Harris stayed there in Kirtland. He became the unofficial caretaker of the Kirtland Temple. And for about 25 cents, he'll, he'll give you a tour of the temple. Well, he's there in Kirtland, and he's there for many years. And many years go by. His son, Martin Harris Jr., and his family, they went to Salt Lake, and they settled up in uh, Cache Valley and um, near, near Logan in Clarks, Clarkston, Utah, just outside of Logan. And um, Brigham Young made several attempts at inviting Martin Harris to come to Salt Lake. As missionaries would pass from Salt Lake to the east, they'd go through Kirtland, they'd want to meet Martin Harris, they'd want to hear his testimony, and they would pass along the messages from Brigham that, please come to Salt Lake, please be reassociated with the saints. Martin Harris can continued to deny it, put it down. Finally, Brigham says, your family is out here. Come and see your grandchildren. Be close to your family and be, with the, be reunited with the saints. And unlike everybody else, Martin, you don't have to walk across the plains. I'll buy you a train ticket and it will zip you right here to downtown Salt Lake. Martin Harris says, fine, I'll come, but make sure that my train ticket is round trip because I'm coming back. I'm not staying. He gets on the train. He goes into Salt Lake and he's um, uh, Brigham Young rolls out the red carpet, essentially, for Martin Harris. He sends out a stagecoach to pick him up. He puts the old man, Martin Harris, into the stagecoach, and the stagecoach is driven into Salt Lake. He gets to the point where he's kind of up on a little bluff, and he can see down into the Salt Lake Valley. He pulls back the curtain of the stagecoach, and he sees about 60,000 residents, buildings, businesses, farms, roads, the tabernacle, the Salt Lake Temple is being built, 
the wall around Temple Square is there. And he says, all of this because of the Book of Mormon. He didn't elaborate what he meant, but we can speculate that all these people have gathered in the middle of nowhere to be near a prophet, to be associated with the saints because they have a testimony that the Book of Mormon is true. All of this because of the Book of Mormon. Well, he comes into town. Brigham welcomes him with open arms, of course. He speaks in the tabernacle, testifying of his experience as one of the three witnesses, testifying of the Book of Mormon and its truthfulness. He heads up to Clarkston, Utah, and moves in with his family, and that's where he lives the rest of his life. He's buried there uh, in the local cemetery up there in, in North Utah. And he's, he's nearing death, and he's literally on his deathbed, the very spot he'll pass away. And on July 10, 1875, now do the quick math and think how many years it has been and how he was disassociated for so many of those years and how his marriage crumbled because of his testimony of the Book of Mormon. And he lost his, he didn't lose his farm, but he willingly gave his farm for the publication of the Book of Mormon. Everything that Martin Harris had been through, all this time that had passed. And he's laying on his deathbed. And someone was wise enough to get one more testimony from him. And he says this with his final breath. Yes, I did see the plates on which the Book of Mormon was written. I did see the angel. I did hear the voice of God. And I do know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, holding the keys of the holy priesthood. At his funeral, before they closed the casket and, and started the funeral, uh, it's recorded that they placed underneath Martin Harris's arm, one of his arms, a copy of the Doctrine and Covenants, and under the other arm, a copy of the Book of Mormon. So to this day, Martin Harris is clutching a copy of the Book of Mormon, that book that he so, knew so well to be true. Now, these sections that you're studying, sections 14 through 17, they don't say anything about the eight witnesses, but let me tell you just very briefly, the eight witnesses, you can look in the front cover of your Book of Mormon to see who those eight people were. You'll recognize the names of them. And they uh, saw the plates, not the angel, but they saw the plates in the sacred grove. They had gathered in Palmyra and, uh, and uh, it was time to have their, their witness experience. Joseph escorted them into the sacred grove, and there on a log was left the plates. And uh, it was it was just testify the, the way the story is recorded and testified of is that the angel went left the plates and then excused himself essentially. So they didn't see the angel, but they they didn't hear the see the light. They didn't hear the voice from heaven like the three witnesses, but they were able to pick up the plates, pass them around to each other, flip over the the leaves, the, the pages of the plates and examine them closely. There's the three witnesses. There's the eight witnesses. We've talked about Mary Whitmer's being a witness. Let me tell you about two other ladies who are witnesses of the Book of Mormon. The first one I want to share with you is Emma Smith. Emma Smith should, one of her many titles and attributes should be witnesser of the Book of Mormon, if that's a word, or a witness of the Book of Mormon. And I'll tell you why. She passed away in April 1879. Now you think of when Joseph died, 1844, and so that's 35 years after Joseph passes away. She's still living in Nauvoo, and a couple of months before she passes away, her son, Joseph Smith III, approaches his mother to give a formal interview. Now the reason I say formal is because it was, it was set, it was, the time and place was set. The permission was requested and granted from, to Emma and from Emma to have this interview be recorded and not only recorded, but also published. And so this, this, this was a serious thing. So Joseph Smith III sits down with witnesses and recorders who, who are taking notes of the conversation. And it's more than conversation. It's a specific question, specific answer, specific question, specific answer. Uh, and this is in 1879, 35 years after Joseph passed away. I'll, I'll share with you some of it, some of the full uh, interview. Question, are you sure 
that he, meaning Joseph Smith, are you sure that he had the plates at the time you were writing for him? Now the questioner is asking about is asking him about when you were writing for her. She acted as scribe for a time. So as so the details behind the question, Emma's acting as scribe, and specifically, while you were scribe, are you sure he had the plates? In other words, was he reading off of a manuscript or was he reading out of a book? That sort of thing. So are you sure that he had the plates at the time you were writing for him? Emma Smith. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given him to fold them in. I once felt the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book. Question. Could not Father have dictated the Book of Mormon to you, Oliver Cowdery, and the others who wrote for him after having first written it or having first read it out of some other book? Answer from Emma. Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter, let alone dictate a book like the Book of Mormon. And though I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder, as much so as to anyone else. Here's another question. I suppose that you would have uncovered the plates and examined them. This is what separates Emma's testimony from the testimony that Martin Harris had early. Uh, not the testimony that I just concluded Martin Harris with, but you'll remember in section 10, Martin Harris um, uh, wanted to see, the, the, the reason section 10 was, came about is because Martin Harris wanted to see, am I thinking of the right one? No, it's section five. Section five, Martin Harris wanted to see the plates. And, excuse me, let me just verify here. To Martin Harris, yes. So section five, so section five came about because Martin Harris wanted to see the plates so that he could have a sure testimony of it, right? So uh, let me get back here. This is where Emma's testimony and Martin's testimony early on, when the translation was taking place in Harmony, Pennsylvania, differed. Night and day difference. Martin says to have a testimony, I got to see these plates. But look at this. Emma's question. Uh, the question to Emma. After she talks about the plates being on the table. She was right there. They were right there in front of me, just wrapped in a linen cloth. The question, I should suppose that you would have uncovered the plates and examined them. And this is where she proves that she's a witness. I did not attempt at handling the plates other than I have told you, nor uncover them to look at them. And here it is. I was satisfied that it was the work of God and therefore did not feel it to be necessary to do so. What was it necessary? To see the plates. In other words, son, she's talking to her son, Joseph Smith III. Son, I have a testimony that the Book of Mormon is true. And it's, I got that testimony not because I saw him. I didn't need to see the plates. Did Father try to hide them from me? No. Did I see him? No. Because I didn't need to. That wouldn't have given me more surety of my testimony than she had then. The last question that I'll share with you. He says, Mother, what is your belief about the authenticity or origin of the Book of Mormon? And her testimony that qualifies her in my mind to be a witness of the Book of Mormon. My belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscript unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour, and when returning after meals or after interruptions, he could at once begin where he had left off, without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. This was a usual thing for him to do. It would have been impossible that a learned man could have done this, and for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. 35 years after the martyrdom, this experience happened. I'll conclude with this story, and it's a more personal story. This woman's name is Pauline Murray. Pauline Murray, she's not alive anymore, but she did live in Australia. 
And I met her when I was a missionary there a few years ago. When I met with Pauline, she wanted to contend with the um, testimony that, that we were bringing and the message that we were sharing with her. But that quickly went away after just a few minutes when she noticed that we weren't interested in fighting about doctrine. And with that, she started to ask questions. Now, Pauline Murray sits about this tall, maybe even shorter than that. She's about four foot nothing. She is of Italian descent. She is the one of the, and she was 86 years old when we met her. I have never met anyone inside the church or outside or ever heard of anyone who knew the Bible better than little Italian Pauline Murray. She knew that thing word for word. And it was interesting as we started to teach her the principles of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, she would open up her Bible and she'd say, I believe that because it says it right here. And we'd share another principle and she'd say, I always believe that too, it's right here. And, she, and we'd teach another principle and this would go on and on for the couple of weeks. And she started to, she said one time, she said, why don't more churches teach what you're teaching? It's plainly written right here in the Bible. Why is your church the only one that's practicing it? Anyway, this is a great experience we were having. We invited her to be baptized. She said that she would be baptized. We went away as, as we did at the end of each uh, lesson, and we came back for the next lesson, and she said, I can't be baptized. And as we started to talk to her, she reminded us of things that we already knew about her, things that she had already shared with us. And that was that she was 86 years old, that she taught Bible school at the Catholic Church on Tuesday. She organized and ran the Catholic women's activity every week at the church on Wednesday. She'd say, if I got baptized, who would teach Bible school? If I got baptized, who would run the activities? She went to church every single Sunday. She was married in the Catholic Church. Her children were baptized Catholics. They were also uh, married in Catholic churches. And her grandchildren were being raised as devout Catholics. She said, how do I do this? I'm 86 years old. She said, Elder Pettit, if I had met you 20 years ago, if I was younger, of course I'd get baptized because I know it's true. And she says, now at my old age, in my circumstances, I just can't do it. Yeah, I don't think it would be right for me to get baptized. Well, my companion and I, we glanced at each other. What do we do now? And whenever you get stuck in a pickle like that, you, you always go to the best solution, and that's to pray. So we invited her to pray. We said, Pauline, we're not going to talk you into being baptized, but uh, why don't you just pray and ask what God would have you do? Oh, we knew the answer she'd get. So we knelt down with her and prayed. My companion, Elder Anderson, he's, he's as tall as me, well over 6'2", six, 6'3", six, six, whatever. And, uh, and little Pauline, she's a, if she's four foot, she's just barely four foot. And so as we knelt, she was, she was really far down below us. And we could, we could look down and just watch this little teeny tiny gray white haired lady as she prayed with all of her heart. Every ounce of faith that she had developed over the 86 years was put into this prayer. And I'll never forget, it's exactly word for word, her prayer, Heavenly Father, is Joseph Smith a prophet? And is the Book of Mormon true? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So we had taught her to pray like a Latter-day Saint. And that, that, that was her prayer. And we waited. And we waited what seemed like forever. But finally, eventually, little Pauline Murray, she looks way up at us, as we're towering over her, right? She looks way up at us, and she has tears streaming down her face. And she says, I'll never forget, word for word here. She says, uh, so Joseph Smith, the prophet of God, and the Book of Mormon is true. Because of that, what else matters? And with that testimony, she was baptized the following Sunday. And I've often looked back on that experience and I've thought, what else matters? History, doctrine, all these things, they leave questions that we might not have the answer, or we haven't developed our faith and our testimony to some extent or whatever. But regardless of all that, if we know that Joseph Smith 
really did see God in Jesus Christ in the sacred grove, and we know that the Book of Mormon is true, we can rely on that because what else matters? As long as we have those two things, we're good, and we can be just fine. She was about 15 or so years early to President Uchtdorf's talk about doubting your doubts. Do I have doubts? Well, if I do or don't, what else matters? Who cares? Because Joseph Smith's a prophet and the Book of Mormon is true. And for that, I claim that Pauline Murray is a witness of the Book of Mormon. In the link below, or, a couple, or in the video description below, there's a couple of links. One is to a movie called A Day for the Eternities. It's a church production, and it talks about the Whitmers and Joseph moving to the Whitmer farm, and it talks about the three witnesses and their experience. It's 20 or so minutes long, and it's awesome. So go ahead and check out that. The link below that is a link to my blog, which will take you to the archive of all these beyond Come Follow Me's if you want to go back and see past ones. Uh, if, if you'd like to. Uh, and with that, you are going to be studying the amazing sections of 14, 15, 16, and 17, and I hope you've enjoyed the historical background of those sections. Of the things I've said, I testify they are true, and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Have a great week. For more videos about our church history, make sure to subscribe.